It's a high-tech conversation. And a low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this week's Bench Talk 101. Um, this week we've got a, a great speaker, Stephen, who's going to talk about Nailed It. Um, but we can see that the weather is changing. I'm looking around now and uh, a lot of us are wearing thick jumpers because uh, it really has got a bit colder. Um, we've also had a little chat about the COVID situation. Um, obviously, it's, it's increasing now, um, seven, oh, just over 7,000 cases a day at the moment, um, which is really affecting the, the universities, as we hear from, from Schoenig. Um, and, and we've had our, our, our single case um, yesterday that meant that we've had to uh, send all of year 11 home. Okay, so it's not good. So please keep safe, everybody. Please make sure that you are doing whatever you can to, to keep yourself safe. We don't want to have anybody ending up in hospital from this group. Um, so uh, w without further ado, I'm, I'm going to be asking Stephen to, to uh, give his presentation. So I'm going to put it onto speaker view. I, I recommend that you all do that. Um, and I will mute myself. Um, and uh, Stephen, over to you. Okay, Jeffrey, what I'm wanting to do now is that I've got the share board. get into my talk. Well, what we have here are three of the Fort costumed uh, reenactors that do work or in and around the Fort. Uh, Mr. McNaughton here is a, a logger, a, saw, a sawyer. Um, his job is to provide board and beam based on the needs of Captain Sutter and or any of the uh, project managers from the fort. Uh, this gentleman here is Mr. Uh, Michael Blair. He is a dressed as a blacksmith. Um, he made most of the tools here that you see. And then there's myself as the master carpenter, chief of the shop. And at the time I was portraying James Wilson Marshall, who is the head mechanic for Captain Sutter. Uh, he was in charge of putting together the various woodworking projects, including the sawmill in the Kaluma Valley that later gold was discovered and the rest is history. But we've got a, uh, a plane from the late 1700s I'm holding there and then a uh, nice uh, chisel used for debarking trees and one of the guns that I've built. Uh, it's a remake of or recreation of a Wesson rifle that uh, was used during that time period. And we'll move on to the next part of our talk. But this gives you a feel for what people look like back in those days, the 1840s, which is the primary focus of Sutter's Fort. But first, welcome to California. This is San Francisco at 12 noon a few weeks back. And uh, I think it looks that way this today and yesterday. Um, a lot of smoke from the various fires in California and we're going through. And um, historically, the state has always had issues with summertime fires since our rainy season lasts from uh, late October to early April or late April, and the rest of the time of the year, we get dry lightning strike storms, etc. Here's an example of, well, if you've ever, if you've seen any of the American spoof movies like Snar Sharknado, this is reality. This is a fire NATO. Uh, we get them in extremely hot fire conditions where the fire generates its own weather patterns. Uh, but more to Sutter's Fort. Sutter's Fort was, they started construction in 1839 and built it in a much larger form. What you see today is the 1893 um, restoration of the fort. Um, it was the first rebuilt fort in the United States. And 
the scene of where we do most of our reenactment and our carpentry and blacksmithing, gunsmithing, blacksmithing, metal trades, textile arts, cooking, um, everything done in the style of the 1840s period. Now this area right here, where you see that white canvas fly, that's part of the roof of the Ramada. Um, it's a basically a, a wood frame structure nailed together that is used to hang canvas off of. And the reason why it's not shingled like the rest of the fort is this is considered a temporary structure. And Sutter sold his fort after the gold rush started. So by 1850, he no longer had the fort. So for the 10 years that he was in existence, this is a best re representation of what we have here at the fort. Um, so interpreting what we want to discuss here are the types of structures he had. This particular one is a nailed structure, but the beams and boards are together, very, look very similar to a timber frame structure, which is here we have a 10 by 10 timber frame cell structure that was manufactured by the docents and volunteers. And we'll get more of that later. Next image. In 1983, just as my wife and I were starting to come to the fort and do our recreation of the 1840s, we had these two visitors show up on our doorstep. Um, we have uh, one of our docents here, George Stammer Johan, who was at the time portraying the Captain Sutter at the fort and the Austrian or European pronunciation of Sutter is Sutter and we do that when we are in character when we are addressing the captain. And he is escorting the queen around the fort and he's the docent stayed in 1840s character. So when they were just when George was discussing times around the fort he was asking how Queen Victoria was doing and everyone stayed in character. And what was really brilliant about the royal couple is they stayed in character too as members of the royal family. And they, at the end, gave their would give their best regards from Captain Souter to the good Queen Victoria. Um, it gives you an idea of the types of actions that we would see uh, at that time, reenacting with the general public. What's interesting is that if the queen was interested in something, she would ask Philip to go over, pick it up, examine it, show it to her. And if she chose to, she would touch it. Otherwise, he would act as the interface between reality world of the items around the fort and uh, what the queen was interested in. They are one of the best educated tourists that have ever come to the fort. They knew their stuff before they even showed up. On their visit to California in 1983, they only wanted to go three places. One was Sutter's Fort, the other was the Yosemite Valley, and the other was a museum in Southern California. This is my wife and I. Judy and I dressed in what is currently our, our current level of costume. Um, they're in layers, at least I am. So depending upon how hot it is to work, we're able to um, get down to what would be considered socially acceptable clothing level to do the work that we needed to do. Our primary visitors at the fort are children, fourth grade California history classes. And they're, they, they ha we have a program called ELP, Environmental Living Program, which lasts 24 hours a day for that day. The children are there at the fort from nine in the morning until nine the next morning. They cook, eat, sleep. And uh, right now we see a horse-drawn wagon bring a class to the fort children, schools have a choice to do that or not. And here we see uh, a miniature living history at the fort where the children, the environmental living history classes dress up in costume. We have a young gentleman as Captain Sutter, 
or Captain Souter, and the children are, are being told how the day will be organized. They do various crafts and trades, and the parents who teach carpentry, every child gets to build a, a project of the school's choice that they get to take home. Anyway, this is an example. These are some of our docents. The reason why I chose this picture is um, father and son and mother. Um, father is a luthier by hobby, but he knows how to repair fiddles and instruments of all kinds. And he, uh, the youngest son, the guitar you see him playing, he built from scratch. Uh, they know their stuff. We have a lot of scholars and well-trained people whose hobbies are the craft and trades that are demonstrating at the fort. Uh, this is an example of the blacksmith shop, I'm sorry, the gunsmith shop, and all, all the furnishing you see in the room, all the structures we build at the carpenter shop for the restoration of this room to what a gunsmith shop at the fort was described to contain. Um, won't go into too much more detail, but every one of the uh, shotguns, smoothbores, and flintlocks, cap locks, and rifles are shootable, and most of them are exceedingly accurate, out to 300 yards. Next. Here is the captain's office, all the furniture we made in the shop starting in the 1980s um, to uh, the end of 1990s is when we stopped doing a lot of our furniture. Uh, the rope bed, um, uh, a, a chest, the table. We don't do chairs because we're not set up for the proper materials. This is an image stopped from one of our virtual tours of the fort that are um, uh, produced during these days of COVID. And we also did it for special senior networks uh, back in the 19, actually, this would be about 2010, because this was the last piece that I built. Um, there's only one screw in the entire desk. It has uh, 25 compartments, four secret compartments. When you lift the desk up, it's layered, <laughs> and we can talk about that kind of stuff at another time. Now, we also try to get community involvement at the fort. And we had a, uh, you can see the timber frame structure in the back. Uh, what we're about to do here is recreate the Ramada that had been destroyed by a windstorm a couple of years prior. All the materials that you see here, for the most part, we're using hand tools. Um, there might be a few, well, what it is is a time stop action. It took us 90 minutes from the time this starts to the time it's done. So I'll start that now. And I can talk over this. That slowly everything is assembled on ground and then brought up. And then various parts are layered on. And we're done. And here we are all complete. This is the finished structure. All the members who you saw in that quick video are uh, here. And this is the model that I'm holding in my hand of this structure. And we use, I, for any major structures that our team constructs, I build the wooden models to scale uh, so that we can make any adjustments at that point in time as to whether we make it wider, higher, taller, etc. This is all uh, cut redwood from the California State Park redwood forests of downed trees that were had to be removed because of hazards. Otherwise, we let the trees stay on the ground because that's where the future redwood trees grow out of. Uh, again, more on that later. This is after we've put the canvas tarp on it. And what we have here are some of the things that um, 
myself and one of the other docent carpenters are working on. Uh, we do a lot of table repair. This is a folding table. It takes about oh, 10 seconds to unfold and set up and takes about three or four seconds to drop it in place so you can carry it off. These are broken. This is a broken table that we're going to be repairing. Um, a saw bench, uh, the chair, again, this is this will repair chairs. As you can see, we've used glue and twine to rebuild the integral structure of the spindle. Um, so we've got a wagon in the background. It's a standard freight wagon that would have come to California uh, prior to the gold rush. And uh, you can see the nail stains here in the redwood, um, the acids over time. This has only been about a year and a half of being exposed to the weather. But this is exactly what we want to show and what we interpret um, to the general public when we're discussing woodworking in that 1840 time period. Um, this is our illustrious cannon crew, one of them. My wife, Judy, is a member, a card-carrying cannoneer at the fort. We're all trained by state parks. And um, we have an all-women's cannon crew. Uh, when, they, when, when they do their particular presentations. But here we are. That's Judy, who will be lighting off the cannon, and two of the other cannoneer team members. And we're going to play this as our final shot as we transition to the nail and the hammer presentation. So we're, that was a, a blast from the fort. So here we are uh, with my tool talk on nails of the, t of the 1840s. I'll just use this as a uh, splash screen because in fact, it is uh, the last of the cut nail factories in North America. Uh, they have, I think almost tenfold increased the size of their original mill which had uh, 60 nail making machines on it. It's, they're now a couple hundred, um, but their warehouse, because they're now supplying cut nails to the restorers of around the uh, world. Um, cut nails, uh, the research I've done, we've determined that in the colonies around 1750, the mill rights in New England figured out how to automate the process of manufacturing a cut nail. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate a little bit later the, the type of hand wrought nails from, I've, I've got an example from Rome around between 100 and 400 AD um, up to the present cut nails when I start distributing, but I'm gonna talk briefly from here um, they, uh, the British found out about the manufacturing facilities and uh, promptly disassembled the plants and moved them back to England, where they started producing cut nails. And then a few years later, the continent found out about it through industrial espionage or somebody being paid off, whatever. And so Europe and England started producing mass producing cut nails. The problem is when the British disassembled the plants in, in the New England states where they were located, um, all the heading machines that's putting the flat end on the end of the uh, nail uh, were hidden. And so they got how to make the nail, but they still had to manually put a head on each nail. Uh, so they were, they did reduce the quantity or the cost per unit, but not as much as the Americans could have if we were fully automating the entire process. Um, an example is uh, the documents at Monticello, that was Thomas Jefferson's estate in Virginia, 
Um, they documented that some of the slave uh, nailers or nailers who were basically a trade of making nails uh, from dawn to dusk would manufacture uh, at best a thousand nails per person per day. Um, I've talked to modern day blacksmiths and say, how long would it take you to make this kind of nail? And they said it would take, maybe I could do 20, 25 nails a day. And I asked them, do you know in the olden times they were doing up to a thousand? And their response was they must have been brain dead because by the time they finished the 20th or 25th nail, their brain goes to sleep and they start making mistakes. And so they, they do not produce a lot of nails, but we can still, there are a lot of blacksmiths throughout the United States who do make hand wrought nails if necessary or fasteners. A Tremont Nail Company was formed in the warm Massachusetts area around 1819. After the war, the United States rebuilt the, fact, the nail factories, brought the automatic heading machines in, and suddenly we were producing nails um, at a rate lower than um, what the European and the UK, or in those days, Great Britain, could produce. And so we sold a lot of nails. And, and it turns out that making needles and pins are a variation on this process. And so needles, pins, and nails were what the United States early uh, overseas trade consisted of in mass. And the taxes helped pay off the, the war debt uh, of both war, uh, the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Um, so in, in, in 1812, um, pretty much um, ended any worry about invasions of British troops on US soil. So by 1819, um, some, and, and throughout New England, nail manufacturing facilities started building, uh, rebuilding in major earnest. And um, even though with fires and everything else, Tremont Nail Company is still manufacturing nails today up until, like I said, uh, about eight or nine years ago, they were, they were still producing at their original site. Um, and they, they were able to satisfy almost everybody, but when the other nail companies stopped doing it, they had to increase their facilities to kick out the amount of nails. Moving on, um, they sell both a cardboard or a wood plaque version for those of you who are doing education. This is um, a, a little brief history on nails and then samples of the types of nails that they manufacture and sell. Um, and depending upon the uh, nature of the need, um, if it's a primary nail popular by a lot of people, the unit cost is lower than a special run of uh, nails that people aren't using as much. So the clout nail and the hinge nail are the types of nails that we use when we're doing, uh, and the clinch nail are the types of nails we use when we are uh, doing through the board penetration and stapling on the reverse side and we want a door or uh, multiple boards coming together. And so I'm going to get out of the slideshow and get back to my real life uh, form. And we'll talk about nails. Um, the, here's an example of a, a Roman nail. I'm sorry, I, I, I have a palsy that seems to have come on with age. Uh, sorry, we'll get it here. There we go. Um, it's kind of same width on all three side, all four sides, and it has the a pounded nail on the end of it. Now, we don't know if they were adding an, a head to the nail, and this is being done hot, 
because a nailer usually worked with heated iron to uh, make the assembly and to draw out the nail. And so this was uh, fr uh, from a Roman uh, archaeological dig and the dating on this is somewhere between 100 and 400 AD. Now there are there's a nail factory in France that is manufacturing a variation on the same type of nail. It's four sides are pretty well equal on each side. This is what they call their diamond pattern. And this is used by, and, and it comes down to a four-sided wedge on the point. Now it's not super sharp, it's blunted a little bit, but the problem is when going in with the wood, especially on the end pieces of, of wood, you would have to pre-drill a hole or the wedges on the nail would um, cause the wood to split. Well, while this is machine manufactured today, it's a good example of the type of nail or fastener that was handmade by blacksmiths, or in the case of the Romans, like this. So the issue is, is you've got a tapered wedge. And in certain woods, that would cause end grains to split out if no matter how you oriented the nail. So the, 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 the nail manufacturers in New England um, came up with a design and this is their big brother, I call him Spike. But you'll notice the two sides are parallel. It's the thickness of the sheet metal or iron that is fed into the nail making machine. And then there are two sides that form a tapered wedge. At the end of the nail is flat. And the head of the nail, uh, get it to the camera there. This would be called a rose head pattern nail. And one of the, the, the interesting things about this design of the nail is when you hit it with a hammer, because you've got the raised top, the force would be driven into the main part or the center of the nail, thus giving more efficiency as the nail is driven in. If you missed the top of the nail and came off the side with your hammer, you could fracture the sides off. And that's the problem with any headed nail is making sure you squarely strike the nail surface with a hammer. Um, here we have this is a, a rose, again, a rose head. This is a clinch nail. You notice that the, it has a, a, a wide section in the middle. But again, like all the other nails, it, it's, it's flat from the stock and then tapered by the machine. And the, what's that, what is, how that's done is there are shears the stock is fed in, the shear comes down and takes one edge and then it lifts up and then the next piece, it gets pushed further and then a, a second shear with the complementary angle would shear down and that gets you your tapered shape. And so the stock was constantly being fed in, no waste, no want because the shears were designed so that the next piece of wood or metal that was being cut would be fed into that machine at the proper angle. Now, the, like I said, we were, the economics of things as such is like you're dealing with, I'm gonna, now I'll leave the glasses on, you can see better. The, um, the, a nailer can produce maybe a, hundred, a thousand nails a day. A single machine can produce up to 30,000 nails an hour. This was being powered by water and later by steam. And so by the 1819 time period that Tremont or Warham, Massachusetts Nail or Warham Nail Company was formed, they were operating under steam power. 
So they had transitioned from the water to the steam mo lo um, locomotive powers for all their mills. Um, and then later on, modern day, they converted obviously from steam to electric motor drives, but half of the machines, nail machines, um, at the, in, in the 1990s, 1980s, half the nail machines at, at now Tremont Nail Company um, were the original machines. Obviously maintenance and parts and wear and all that uh, had to be uh, replaced, but um, let's see, just wanna check something here. Okay. Um, and so the, um, so the modern day machines are still as efficient as the older machines. And there's just a lot more of them as they've had to increase their production. Um, also one of uh, the other type of nails we're getting is for boat building. And this is a copper rove that's also manufactured not by, it used to be manufactured by Tremont Company, but I think another company has now uh, replaced them. These are available with Lee Valley Tools. And they have a, a copper, um, um, washer for whatever, rove. Um, anyway, the, The nail would be driven through this, and I have the I have uh, the dies that would you'd sit this on top, and then you'd drive the nail through it. So on one side you'd have one side going in this direction, and and on the bottom side you'd drive it over the top of it. You'd clinch or cut off a bit of the copper nail, and then you'd peen it over, and now you've got a solid copper joint. And for anything that deals with water uh, shipping, you would use your, your copper nails. A um, couple, another. This, these are little, these are great for little box projects. They come in different lengths. Um, I have inch and a half. I have, I typically use inch and a half or longer for most of my projects, but you, you can get some of these nails all the way down to a half inch uh, in length. And again, going on the Tremont Nail Company website, they ship all over the world. Um, and then there are people who buy a thousand pounds or 10,000 pounds of nails and then at, at the low price and then resell it on places like Amazon and local hardware stores who, who do restoration supply. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of the type of nails we have. Um, we can discuss a little bit more about nail use. Um, I, I, one of the things that I really like about the clinch nail in this design is if you've got say three or four layers of wood, like you're building a door and you, you've got a piece of wood going this way, a piece of wood going that way, and then another piece um, going in that direction. So let's say you got three plies and you want to make that door really strong. You would pre-drill a certain uh, a hole. And the way you, you do that is the thickness of the, of the metal that's used to manufacture that particular length and nail is what you use to determine the diameter of the drill that you're going to use to pre-drill a hole, especially if you're if you're going to assembly a, assemble a door, or or put on uh, hinge hardware and so on, you want to choose your your clinch nail so that it sticks out an inch to an inch and a half beyond the other side of the piece of wood. So when you drive it on. Then you have the, the grain of the wood going in this direction. What you wanna do is the nail head, you would then drive it and make a little, a little loop. Um, and I've got ways of discussing how we do it before, but we've limited in time here. But you, you fold it back and you drive it so that the nail head is peened or 
driven as a staple, so it is perpendicular to the grain of the wood. If it was parallel with the grain of the wood, all someone would have to do is pull on it and the nail might split through the wood and the grain. But by running it perpendicular, you're using the strength of the wood to hold that nail in place. And the more nails you put in the door, typically the way I was told um, when we were touring uh, old York in England, that um, the more metal in the door means uh, that place is less safe. It slowed the ax or the hatchet or the sword trying to cut through the door. Um, it would dull the edges and make the person, it would give the person inside the house um, a, a greater amount of time to um, react so that they could defend the portal and uh, from somebody who's trying to break in. Just a little side history. We've got, after 37 years of working in this area, I've got a lot of stories to tell. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, nail removal. Now, one of the beautiful things about a cut nail is that you've got a very smooth parallel sides, but the, the cutting edge that, that was cleaved by the cutting irons or in the, in the, in the mill, um, this area is very rough. And so when the nail is driven into the wood, and you would have the parallel sides parallel with your grain. There's an orientation that's critical on this nail. And so what it does is it, it makes a V-shaped pocket in the wood and the grain, because it's punching its way through the fibers, it's the grain is up against those, that rough surface of the wedge portion of the nail as it's going in. And then um, it's just smoothly passing by the side walls of the cells as it's going in and through the wood. Um, when you work the nail, and it, it takes, it's, it's not an easy task to do. So, um, but anyway, once you're able to pop the nail free, suddenly you now have a void on either side of that wood structure where the the, the cellular structure was holding the nail in place is no longer there. And with the smooth sides of the nails, these nails were easy to extract. And that was necessary when people decided to change or enlarge a barn or a shed or a house, and they needed to remove the nails from the wood. It made it a lot easier to pull the nails out. And in a lot of cases, if you know what you're doing, you can extract that nail and reuse it somewhere else because the nail doesn't, doesn't even bend. Um, and typically, well, let's, let's talk hammers. Here's an example of a blacksmith manufactured hammer. And it's, it's got some stamps on it from previous owners. But this, this hammer I purchased at a tool, um, Oh, uh, you call um, well, it's a tool swap meet, and I purchased it for three dollars American with a hammer handle. Now, we I check back with the manufacturers, and this head style is uh, from the late 1700s, so this is obviously a more recent handle that has been put on there. And I figure this was happened, the, the handle was properly installed probably in the um, early 1900s. And the hammer when used, it, it just feels like a natural extension of the body. The weight is just absolutely perfect. I liked it so much, but trying to drive in a spike with this hammer is not an easy task to do. So we need to add more ma mass to the, the hammer head. And so, uh, either I use a, a, a three pound sledgehammer or something like that, but that doesn't give you the control and the finesse. So um, over the years I've searched eBay and so on, and I was able to find a two pound hammerhead, very similar in style. Again, whoever owned it decided to emboss their names on it, but eventually it showed up 
on eBay and I bought this for $5, just the hammer head. And then I designed this hammer handle because I noticed that when I'm using heavier handles, I either need to get close to the work or I need to take a full swing. So I, I like to experiment with the ergonomics of the handle design. Now this is American hickory uh, is the wood that's used for the hammer. And I've noticed that in well-used tools over the years of collecting the handles of the tools being used so much started to take on the shape of the hand that used the tool. And that's one of the things that are very interesting to us at the fort is the, the anthropology, the, the archeology, span the history, they all come together in how humans use the tool in the time period. So this is, this is about a year and a half old and I'm just playing around with handle shapes to find out how efficient it is in, in large swing and small swing work and whether, because I've seen handles of tools that kind of have this center mass and then two areas of wear. And so we're, we're trying to see how this works. Now I may find I have to reduce the width um, to fit my hand more often, but I first need to find a project that I'm driving a lot of nails in. But it's interesting in the 1840s, we start to see a transition in this type of style of hammer design. Because one of the big problems is when you're using the claw on the back to remove a nail, you're removing a lot of really tight nails and you do this a lot, eventually the hammer handle gets pulled out of the head of the hammer. So a lot of toolboxes of the 1840s will have a tool similar to this in the box. And this has a screwdriver used for prying and a, a, a forked section. This is blacksmith, sorry for the jingling, but this is made by a blacksmith. And the claw would be used to wrap around would wrap the head of the nail and then rock back on this using this as fulcrum and could bend the nail out and pull the nail out. Or you can just pull it out a little bit, inch up, pull out, inch up, pull out. And that way you end up with a nail that doesn't require straightening out um, as, it, as it does um, when you're pulling out normal handles. And um, this is another tool from that period. This is a DR Barton. And uh, again, it's a nail prying tool designed to get under the head and, and bed. Now, sometimes you might put a protective service under it so that you're not going to dimple or spoil the surface of the wood of the piece of furniture or whatever you're pulling the nail out of. So uh, let's see, I think I've covered it and um, that should be the end of my presentation and uh, I'll hand it back to you, Jeffrey. Um, so are we, have we got any questions in the chat? So we've got Jim, Jim Hendricks for the chat. I thought I'd just show you this, Stephen. Can you see that okay, guys? Let me, let me put you on spotlight. Yeah, that is what you're talking about with clinched, cinched, um, and the you can just see how that's been fabricated with the top and swaged into it. This comes from, and I'll put it up on the screen at the same time because my, I'm not sure my Spanish is uh, from the altar of uh, altar, the altar, so the, the in a church of Joquera uh, Albacete. Uh, La Mancha in Spain, and it's from yeah. the six, six, 1600s. I've got three of them. 
uh, given to me. And it Thomas, is, did the and, door rot? Did the door rot away, and that's why you're able to have that hook in it? Yeah, I, I think it, it put, put was it, part of Jim, the. Yeah, put a put a sign up. I can read it. Oops. I can't. You have to talk when you do it. The altar of Jorge Jorquera Albacete, España, La Mancha. Altar de Jorquera. The altar of Jorquera Albacete, Spain, La Mancha. Don Quixote's. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I think Don Quixote drove his donkey into the door. The door collapsed and the nails fell out. And uh, <laughs> so I've got three of these. <laughs> and um, that's, uh, that's how it came out, Chester. It's absolute truth. Um, now, but they, to me, these are probably the most beautiful things I've got in this workshop. They are absolutely stunning. They're, they're just beautiful. pieces of art. It's just that's just the way that's been made, and and to think that it's actually come from uh, you know a church in the 1600s and uh, but that I was just put I just put it up basically to show you what um, you know in in person that you can actually get the nails out but you just have to take the wood away. I think it I think it <laughs> rotted. <laughs> I, th I think it rotted actually. Um, there were some uh, stuff that. Um, uh, Federico in uh, in uh, in Italy sent me, and this was in the. I've got, I think I've got some bits with nails still in them that I'm not going to be able to get out, but it is a masterpiece. So thank you, Stephen, because you reminded me they decor. They're part of my decor at, above my head here, and I I put them in pride of place, and it's fascinating stuff. Nails, lovely. Good good to hear about your enjoyment for bent bent nails. Um, <laughs> I wonder how they managed to bend that. I wonder how they managed to bend that after driving it through a door. It must have been hot when they put it through the door and and still able to be bent over as well. I think I think what Stephen is implying is that you can bend it once, but you can't unbend it because once you bend it, you've you've put stress in that corner. If you look, there is stress. I can't see if I can get that in there. There are stress uh, radiating marks in that. Let me just. It's upset. Yeah. yeah. So once it's set, that's it. And if you've ever tried, like uh, with brass, if you've got a lever cap on an infill plane and it's bent, if you try and bend it back, it will it will fracture. But if you heat it up and unbend it, that's one way of getting it out to heat it up again and take out the uh, take out the temper in it. But it is they are quite hard. They're hardened steel, so. It's, for, it's forged. This one was created in a forge. Right. And it depends on the type of steel that they use as to whether or not you can bend and rebend and rebend. And we have nails that we can straighten out and reuse and we don't have a breakage. But the type of steel used in the clinch nail is designed to be easily bent. Uh, you do not, it does not require the nail put in hot or anything, it just, the, the, the nature of the steel is malleable to a point where it's very easy to just bend it into a, a J shape, shape and then drive it perpendicular into the grain. Now, that's manufactured cut nails that are designed to do that. A blacksmith, when they manufacture a fastener, may or may not know where their steel is coming from. So in this particular case, it just gets driven in and um, it's uh, and bent over. And you're right, Jim, the, you, you, you would have to cut it out of the door. And that's the whole reason why it's designed that way is you have multiple layers of wood coming, you know, like plywood, but on a larger and uh, it slows things, it slows people down. It's, it, that's what it was designed, above and beyond the hinge mounting and all that. It's just, it, they'll do it in decorative patterns, but the denser the, of the, the number of nails that go in determines how fast or slow an ax can hack its way through. You blunt out the, the ax until it's a, 
Yeah, but I need, I, need your, I need to correct spoiled. your English history. I need to correct your English history on the, on the height of the door. They were all designed for people like me to go through, you see. That was the reason. It's nothing to do with defence. It's, it's everybody was short like me. I'm not joking. <laughs> now, now they have a little bit on the side for a, a funny I, little ponytail. I didn't, I didn't have a little bit on the side at the time. Yeah. I, my wife doesn't know about her anyway. Anyway, Jim, Jim, you're, stop, you're, stop there. Um, so ne next question is from, from Miko. Hey, hi. Um, so I, I tried to build the boarded tool chest from the Anarchist design book from Christopher Schwartz. And I sourced myself some nails. I probably guess the way you showed them before. And, yeah, that's the um, nail. Yeah, and, well, I, I, I sourced them from, from Dictum in Germany. And um, I found that um, they work very well in, in the gash I used for the tool chest with some sprues or fear, some softwood thing. And it worked very, very well. Um, but then I tried to, to nail some oak and uh, then the nail basically gave way and, and buckled and didn't want to go in. So um, I wonder whether it's just my missing hammering skills or some problem I had with a pilot hole I drilled. Or whether maybe just the nail suck. So I don't know. Maybe um, you have an idea what could go wrong there. Well, the the size of your hole may be the um, on a nail similar to these those French nails. Um, I would since they are on a slant on the top board. Um, I would go two thirds of the way up the nail and take a measurement of the thick, thickest part of the nail and use that as, you, uh, and obviously do a test on this, um, but use that as selecting your drill size and then pre drill and then drive it in, especially hardwoods. Um, but even in softwoods, you need to pre-drill a pilot hole. And that's the problem. The problem is really simple when you're dealing with the, the wire cut nail. I'm sorry, not the wire nail, but the cut nail because of its, its, it's the thickness of the plate that was used to manufacture, that the nail was cut out of that allows you to determine the size of uh, drill that you will use to pre-drill a pilot hole. I think it just makes it easier to drive the hole, to get the nail properly aligned. And if you're going from a grain pattern and, and, and also the orientation of the nail, the, uh, the, it's a simple thing to remember is the parallel side nail are parallel with the grain of the wood. Um, if you go the other way, then you got a problem. It's also easier to grab a hold of the nail. If the nails, the grain starts taking the nail and twisting it as you're driving it in, you can grab with a pair of pliers the parallel sides of the nail and steer it back in or twist it back in alignment so it maintains its parallelness as it goes through. Because typically the, the board that it's going into you're either driving it perpendicular into the grains of the wood or its end grain. And under end grain, typically we tell people to drill a pilot hole with a two or three degree off 90. So you got a slight slant so the nail when it goes into the end grain, if the wood tries to pull apart, if you've got opposing nails in two different directions, then the board was left because end grain for in a lot of woods, it's pretty useless as far as trying to maintain. That's why you use screws. Um, they're, they're going beyond the boundary of the, uh, of the wood cellular pattern as it's drive, driven in. I, I, I showed children, I take a pair of uh, uh, plastic straws in a bundle and I show them sideways, it looks like of say red oak going this way. And then uh, you drive a nail in, the nail will hold, the, the, the straws will hold the nail in place. 
But if you take a nail and drop it into the end grain of the straws and then turn them upside down, the nail falls out. Well, that's basically what you're dealing with with end grain and aid for children. We're dealing with fourth grade at Sutter's Fort. So it's a basic concept that they can grasp. It's uh, a good teaching aid. It's just a bundle of straws with a rubber band around two sides and showing how the nails go in and what you do. Brilliant. If you try to put the, and use it as a wedgie, yeah, the, 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 the straws spread out and you can see how, how wood would want to split. It's just something one of our docents came up with, and I borrowed from that. Good, good. Um, R Richard Hughes. Are we all frozen? No, no, we can hear you. Um, so Richard, you've got a um, uh, talk about Swedish nails or something. Yes, yeah. You know, I was I was very interested to hear about uh, nail making in in the USA, um, and I just want to say a few words about what I discovered about nail making in Sweden. About 30 years ago, I, um, I, uh, I visited a, a company called uh, Lukeburgs in the town of Karlskrona, uh, Sweden, and the visit was nothing to do with nails, but uh, they took me on a tour of the factory, and, and in one corner, they were, they were making, uh, making cut nails by, uh, by a semi-automatic process um, uh, for the uh, restoration uh, market, so they, in, 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 you know, for doing uh, conservation or, or restoration of historic uh, buildings, then it was required in Sweden to use the right historic style of, uh, of fasteners, and so this is what they were doing, and it was just a just a, one old guy that was doing it, and um, and, and what he had was um, uh, the he had a handle. A long handle with a clamp on the end of it, and the clamp was attached to a to a um, to a long rectangle of uh, of sheet metal, uh, um, and um, he fed this into the into the machine, um, and uh, as it went in, it triggered the machine to to shear off shear off um, a, a nail, and uh, a sort of a hammer came in from one side, which formed the nail in 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 the same operation. Then he had to withdraw it, and then and then. Um, uh, turn it 180 degrees and, and push it into the machine uh, again for the for the um, for the next nail. The reason for the spinning was because the nail is tapered, so that uh, if if he if he didn't spin it, then um, then the, he he wouldn't be able to uh, to get a say a straight run of nails out of out of one strip. Um, and uh, he, he let me have a go with it, and I'm somewhere I've I've, uh, I've still got the nails as I, as I made. So. Um, but he said to me, a good, a good, you can always tell a good nail, nail maker because they're, they're also a good, good dancer because they need to have um, uh, a good rhythm to keep up with the, with the machine. That's right. And in, in the, what the Americans figured out is you use two knives to cut. So when it moves forward, a second knife comes down and takes out the matching nail. And in feeding the stock, the biggest problem is feeding in the stock. That's where the dangerous part of the job is because when it was, they were manufacturing nails at 30,000 nails per machine per hour in the 1750s. Because they, what you just brilliantly des described was what it would be like trying to do it by hand. Well, they figured out how to not have to spin the metal to get the other, the other side of the, the offset cut. And uh, if you'd look, like I said, if you go to the Tremont Facebook site, they may have their video up. And you can see these machines running in the background. And um, they're, they're now faster than they were simply because you can do more with electric motors. But they, then the thing is, is once you've got the nail cut, then how do you head it? How do you put the different size of nail on? Because, but the, uh, uh, let's see, bring one, it, it looks, Okay. 
someone's grinding in the background. Um, that is just a slight offset. These things would be, if you're doing it by hand, it would be into a, a holder of a certain size. And then on an end, they would, they would hit it with a ha hammer and upside it a little bit. In the case of a, a person who's making nails by hand, uh, iron up and they, they bend it and shape it hot. And then they had a, 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 a die that the nail would slip into and they'd have one for different sizes and thicknesses of fasteners in order to pound the head in and that was done hot. It was not a cold hot um, hit. Um, the, French, the French nail, which they, let's see. That diamond, they call it a diamond pattern. That's, that's, that's done on their machines and that's all machine manufactured too, but um, they're expensive in the United States, but in the UK and, and in Europe, um, the EU, they, they, they don't have a lot of transport costs, but that's what, what's available if you're doing anything that's pre-1750. Um, and cut nails basically from 1750 to 1950, 200 years, they were the most common nail used. Uh, wire nails show up in the late 1800s as a waste idea to the telegraph wire makers. Specific runs, like if you're doing two miles of wire, and they put that on a spool when you do the cutoff, there's a little bit of, of that metal left over. And this is the extrusion method, um, kind of like making sausages. And um, you, they would take those ends and they started finding uses for them. In the United States, if there were like a, um, a couple yards of these cutoffs, they'd twist them together and that's how fire came about. Um, that, that it's a waste product from the telegraph and industry, telegraph wire industry and the wire nails had, were a waste product from that because started people say, oh, that's new and that's interesting. And so they started buying wire nails Wire nails take over from the mid 1950s, and then in the 1960s, when you're spinning air guns and all that kind of stuff around, um, now they put them in clips and slowly but surely, you know, you can stuff more nails in a clip if they start to have a flattened circle component to it. So it's kind of like, whoa, we're going back in a way to cut nails. It's it's a it's a really good design in um, a, a nail that can be extracted and reused. And uh, I wish, right, yeah, we'll, we'll do a re, we'll do a private video thing. We, we'll just kind of, Jeffrey, you yeah. and I will. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll sort something out and, and then go from out. there. I think what we'll do at this point, um, just because we've got, we've got some people leaving is, is just to thank you, Steve, for preparing the talk. Um, so uh, I'd like everybody to raise their bench beverages to Stephen, so to Stephen and the bench. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's a high tech conversation on the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.